This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener right there, listening to me with me in your ears right now. Thanks to every single one of you, including Justin Zellers, Pepper Giese, Carmine Bailey, and new patrons. Welcome them, everybody. Silent Signals and Al. On this episode of DTNS, PC Mag's I as Actar has been using the Galaxy Flip and Razor Plus. Which flip phone is best? We're going to make him tell you. Plus, what to expect from Nintendo's next console, and augmented reality takes a big step forward. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 1st, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from studio with the hatchet, I'm Sarah Lane. From New York City, I'm Ayaz Akhtar. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Big happy birthday to Chewan. From La Seraphim. It's her birthday. Happy birthday. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If any of you in the audience know what I'm talking about, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You'll make my day. Um, hey, Ayaz, you want to do some tech news with me and Sarah today? That sounds delightful. Let's do it. All right. Now, we do have a special message for Canadians today. Um, it's extra special to have you here since Meta has started the process of blocking news links on Facebook and Instagram in Canada in response to the Online News Act but it doesn't stop us from bringing you the quick hits. Uber reported a better than expected Q2 with a record number of ride shares and operating profit for the first time in the company's history. That's a big one. Net income came in at $394 million, up $1 billion year over year because last year it was a loss. The company saw a 22% increase in trips on the platform combined with cost discipline, as CEO Dara Khosrowshahi put it. So much AI news today. Here are the top things you need to know. Axios reports that Google plans to overhaul Google Assistant and start using generative algorithms like BARD with it. In another part of Google, YouTube is testing machine-generated text summaries of videos to appear on the search and watch pages. They would not replace creator-written descriptions. A law in China goes into effect August 15th, requiring generative AI apps to obtain a license in that country. In advance of that law, Apple has removed multiple apps from the App Store in China. If you want to keep AI from using your art to train and then imitate you, Technology Review reports on a couple tools that are meant to make images unusable in generative AI training without changing how they look to humans. Chinese automaker Geely announced it will launch a large language model to help with autonomous driving and in-car entertainment as part of the Galaxy L6 car coming later this year. And finally, the Financial Times reports that Meta plans to launch chatbots called Personas that have unique personalities. So it could be a historical figure like Abraham Lincoln, or it could be a personality with a purpose like getting travel advice from a surfer. You weren't joking. A lot of AI news today. Yeah, no uh, The BBC launched social.bbc, which is an experimental Mastodon server that it's testing for the next six months. Now, you can't create accounts or posts on this exact server, but you can leave replies. The BBC said content moderation is a potential concern since Mastodon doesn't have a dedicated moderation team, but calls it an acceptable risk. That's uh, interesting. If you build it, will they come? A few security items to be aware of today, a flaw called bleeding pipe in the Forge framework that many Minecraft mods use will let attackers control servers and game devices, and you don't want that. So players should update to patched mods or delete unpatched mods and, of course, scan their systems for malware. The FBI is actively warning the public about the malicious use of generative AI to socially engineer targets as well as create malware. Many security researchers believe that guardrails against creating malware in tools like ChatGPT are fairly good, and it's probably easier for most malicious people to find exploits in more traditional manners, but the FBI wants everybody to be aware. And Bleeping Computer warns of a malicious Android app called SafeChat making the rounds that once installed can intercept messages from SMS, Telegram, and Signal. It doesn't break the encryption. It just intercepts them because it's on your phone and it requires user interaction. So be on the lookout for people asking you to install apps that ask for unusual permissions. That's something you should always be on the lookout for, I suppose. In some global drone news, on Monday, China imposed restrictions on exports of long-range civilian drones. This is due to concerns over drones being used for military purposes, even if they're 
civilian drones, on both sides of Russia's war in Ukraine. Export controls take effect today, though some drone exports will still be allowed. Meanwhile, the UK's first drone mail delivery service, a joint effort between Royal Mail and London-based Skyport's drone services, has begun in the remote Scottish islands of Orkney. The drones will carry mail from Stromness to Gramsci and Hoy, hope I'm getting those right, where postal staff will complete their usual delivery routes. The project is a three-month test, although both partners plan to continue it on a permanent basis if it all works out well. You know what Abraham Lincoln used to say about drones? What's that? I don't know, but I'm going to ask that persona from Meta, and uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. On there it. you go. <laughs> All right, we got Nintendo rumors. Ooh. We do. So Video Game Chronicles wow. sources say that development kits for Nintendo's next console have been delivered to key game studios. Now, Nintendo is reportedly planning to launch a new console in the second half of 2024, so... The dates add up. They make sense. But what else are these sources saying? Yeah. Okay. They are claiming it'll be usable in a portable mode. So just like the Nintendo Switch. But it might have an LCD screen instead of an OLED screen to bring the cost down so that there can be more storage. So the cost of manufacturing, maybe not the cost to you. It also will have a cartridge slot, according to the sources, which might make you wonder if it'll support Switch cartridges. Uh, It's worth recalling that in February, Nintendo told investors that the current 98 million Switch users factor into its plans for the next console. So that implied there may be some backwards compatibility. But like you said, Sarah, this none of this is terribly surprising. This is about the time, seven years later after the original Switch, mid-cycle for the PlayStation and the Xbox, that you would expect Nintendo to start talking about bringing out a new console. It's been so long. They're still running, I believe, on a Tegra processor that's in my Shield yep. TV, which is ancient and super old. And this, and the even with the upgraded versions of the Switch, we still didn't get anything other than OLED, maybe a larger screen. All I'm hoping for is that Nintendo doesn't have a Wii U debacle. Just whatever you name this thing. Just make sure people know that oh, it's a right. it's an upgrade and it is backwards compatible. You can have that. That's not there's nothing wrong with that. But then if you have like you know, let's say you call it Switch Advanced. You know, we all figured that out with G- Game Boy Advance. So maybe just stick to that kind of naming convention because next year, if people are like, why don't I just get that old Switch or the Switch U? You don't want that confusion. We are we are in the TikTok pattern of the disappointing Nintendo console, right? Because there was GameCube, which I actually personally I loved, but most people didn't like it. Uh, then there was the Wii, which everybody thought was amazing. Then there was the Wii U, which people did not like. Then there was the Switch, which everybody thinks is amazing. Is it going to be the Switch Cube? <laughs> be like, I mean, it'll be a cube. It, would it just be like a cooler Switch, maybe? Yeah, if it's going to be portable with an LCD screen, that could be enough to to get people upset. If like yeah. it's not that different and it doesn't have as good of a screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 the Switch is so beloved. Um, in fact, I, I feel like I, well, it depends on who's playing, but I feel like I, I hear about like someone's love for the Nintendo Switch quite often, like as if it were sort of new, uh, but it isn't. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, that, I don't know. I, I, uh, I have no real guess here, but I know people are going to be excited about whatever it is. The Wii and the Switch were departures from previous consoles models. It does not sound from these rumors, these these leaks, I guess, that this is a departure. Although this isn't an official word, so we don't know. There might be some other stuff going on we haven't heard about, but I, I think we're going to get an evolution of the Switch and it probably won't be a bad version of the Switch, but it, it I can't imagine them coming out with something that is a huge departure if they're going to make it mobile kind of limited in what you can do i got one idea maybe they could soup it up with some kind of like a sterile dock so the dock is smarter than just pushing through the same signal maybe the on device is a little bit less powerful than the docked device so you can get like 4k on your 4k tv when you're on the go with your lcd you get 1080p and it's not that big a deal because you still can output these major major releases that's the only thing i think could work because it wouldn't confuse like oh there's a new dock does it work my old switch no it doesn't or maybe it does that would be yeah. kind of a, a crazy idea with USB C. that's a good bet something in the dock i like that i'm gonna go with that i'm gonna steal that Sky- and say it was my idea 
<laughs> Slightly related to all of this, uh, for you mechanical keyboard fans out there, you know who you are. 8-Bit Do released its first mechanical keyboard. It's wireless, uh, has 87 keys, is compatible with Windows and Android, and has hot swappable switches, which is nice. There are two editions, but the N edition is inspired by classic NES console designs. Almost all white, has gray, red, and charcoal accents. Makes you feel like the days of yesteryear. You can order it now for $100, shipping August 10th. And now, for all you fans of open standards, you know who you are. A big move in the world of augmented reality. Oh, listen to it. Listen to that crowd of open standards fans. Uh, you know what? We kid. But there are a lot of you out there in the audience. Uh, Adobe, Apple, Autodesk, NVIDIA, and Pixar have formed the Alliance for Open USD to promote a standard for interoperable 3D tools and data. So basically, a standard for augmented reality. Um, this has kind of been, I've seen it compared to JPEG. I've seen it compared to HTML. It's kind of somewhere in between. It's based on Pixar's open source universal scene description. That's the USD in the group's name. NVIDIA already uses USD as the foundation for the Omniverse platform. If you've seen some of the stuff people make for augmented reality there, if you were to create something that someone might want to call part of a metaverse, you'd want something like USD because otherwise you'd have to replicate the geometry, the cameras, the lighting, all the materials for each thing you create on each platform you'd want to make it for. So having a standard means you can use whatever software you want and make it for whatever platform you want as long as they support the standard. With a standard, you just make your thing. Maya, Houdini, Autodesk, 3ds Max, Adobe Substance, 3D Designer, whatever. And then you can know that it's going to work interchangeably. Again, like the graphic interchange format, the GIF. You know, it just works across platforms. OpenUSD Group will work within Linux's Joint Development Foundation, which gives it a path to be recognized by the International Organization of Standardization, uh, ISO. So this could be on its way, probably is on its way to becoming an ISO standard. Uh, and other companies like Epic, Unity, and even IKEA have all expressed support for the standard, uh, the doors have been flown open for others to join the alliance. Uh, you might expect those three companies to maybe step up and join the alliance soon. We're not hearing, though, from Intel or AMD about this, nor have I seen anything from Meta. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Well, I don't know. As you were describing this time, you know, you mentioned the the GIF standard. It also reminds me of you know various video editing programs, right? It's all gotten a lot better. Uh, over the years, but I remember having to like output uh, the same video like 40 different times, depending on where mm -hmm. you wanted the video to live somewhere. Um, oh, that's yeah. st it still can be a headache, but it, it, you know, it's, it's gotten a lot more streamlined because uh, all of the platforms want you to use those platforms, you know, so they just, they decided to make it easier um, and start to agree on things. Uh, yeah, this, this sounds like, it sounds like a great idea. I guess I'm not surprised that Meta's a holdout just because Meta is sort of on its own planet when it comes to the metaverse right now. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what happens, you know, as more companies decide to to jump on the bandwagon. I mean, uh, TechnoBench asked if Microsoft was on that list. Uh, they're not. This is a very small list. This is Apple kind of is the only hardware maker. Well, NVIDIA makes hardware, but they don't make headsets. And Apple's the only headset maker and the others are, are software makers. So it does feel like it's early enough that you might get Microsoft signing up later. Certainly you're you're hearing from Unity, you're hearing from Epic, they'll probably join later. I wonder why Meta's not in on this from the beginning. Did they not want to be or did these companies not want them in on it? I, mm -hmm. I can't imagine they wouldn't have wanted them in on it. Meta must have just declined. If I read the background stories correctly, Pixar open sourced USD several years ago. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah, 2016. That's okay, right. So, so there's no real need to necessarily be on this alliance to do, use USD. To take advantage USD. of it. Right. You're right. Yeah. So they're maybe not going to join the alliance. But the fact that Apple's behind this definitely gives a huge insight to people going, hey, look, they want as many developers as they can to get familiar with some kind of format so they don't have to relearn everything for the Vision, uh, the Vision Pro. The thing is, getting content for these hardware devices that cost thousands of dollars, it better be worth it. And the more people that you can get to work on the same kind of standard, the better. And I'm just thinking that it's only a matter of time before other companies want to be a part of this because then I maybe they can sort of influence what 
parts become more and more standard or not. But then again, it's still open. So anybody out there with any programming skills or even lack of programming skills this, these days, you can just figure out how to make something better. Because one of the other things I was reading about with this is that OpenUSD is kind of a kind of a chunky format, and it wasn't uh-huh. really a mobile interface. And there's a, a competing standard, and I, I could see stuff. It could be like a like the rules of physics. We don't have a unifying theory of everything. There's a small mobile version, and then there's a big everything version. But it, it's it seems like it's a really smart thing for Apple to be part of this, so they actually have content for that expensive, expensive piece of hardware. Yeah, yeah. They want to encourage developers. They want to make it easy for developers. There's some discussion on whether to make Git F uh, part of the standard, so it might get bigger. It's usually Apple holding out from these standards a lot of times because they have a better way of doing it. They're like, well, this standard's nice, but we figured out in a more efficient way. I wonder if that's what's going on. With well, Meta. I mean, they could have helped create it with Pixar, considering Steve Jobs is uh, connection to the company for the longest time. I know. Yeah, there might be connections back there. Yeah, You're so right. maybe there's like, hey, we kind of made this already. We know yeah, it's yeah. good. We're also here. So that's that's my guess. Because why would Apple get ahead of this? They're already on it. Now, for those of you who use Android, I have something for you as well. Ron Richards and Huentue Dao bring you Android Faithful, a podcast devoted exclusively to Android news and information uh, done in partnership with Daily Tech News Show. We're very proud uh, that Ron wanted to work with us on this. So catch it Tuesdays, 8 p.m. East Coast, 5 p.m. Pacific, or just get it whenever you want by subscribing at www.androidfaithful.com. In the past couple of months, Motorola and Samsung have both announced new foldable flip phones, all the rage. So the natural first question is, how do they compare? Which one's better? Now, I, as you've been spending a lot of time recently with both of these phones. So what are your big takeaways and how do they stack up to each other? Okay, let's see if I can show them on screen. We've got the Moto right now in my left hand. We've got the nobody Flip can 5. The, the, nobody on audio can see that, but they, well, you, you don't have to believe me uh, that they are. <laughs> where there, like, I have seen proof. Iaz really does have these two phones. Devices in my hand, and I will say that they excel at different things, and they don't get everything right just yet. The, the Moto Razor Plus figured out how to use a small screen on the front of a device way better than Samsung figured out with the Flip 5, I will say, because the Flip 5's got great gorgeous hardware, it's got uh, better glass, it's got Gorilla Glass, Gorilla glass Mix 2, it's got IPX8 rating, so like it can be dunked in the water, still not dustproof. It's got about the same cameras there, but it's got a very refined design. Then you've got the, the Razer Plus, which is more rounded and it's nice, but the main thing is you almost never have to open the device unless you want to. On the flip, the amount of times you will see something saying, we'll open the phone for this, kind of defeats the purpose to me. I, I wonder what you guys think about this. Do you guys actually want to use a small phone, like something that's a 3.5-inch display or 3.6-inch display, and then choose to open your device? Or do you really just want to pocket a 6.7-inch device in a more compact form factor? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, if I compare it to something like my, you know, and this is iOS, my, my Apple Watch, which gives me a lot of information, but is limited. Um, you know, I have to, I have to grab my phone at some point, you know, for the stuff that I want to do. Uh, but I know that because they're not supposed to, you know, they don't, they're not, they're connected wirelessly, but they're not part of the same machine. So it bothers me less. It might bother me more if my phone was constantly saying, hold it differently. And then you'll, all will be a revealed. I, I get what Gwen was saying on the day of the Samsung announcement, which is, uh, the foldables are great. The Pixel and the and the Samsung is getting closer to the Pixel in in their form factor of they work like a candy bar phone and you open them up. But the flips are more compelling to more people because they're small. Uh, because it's like, oh, I can actually keep this in a smaller pocket. I can keep it in a smaller bag and then open it up and it be a phone. So I, you know, if if I had to come up with a person who'd say no, I want that, it would be someone who's who's doesn't like having to shove a big old candy bar style phone in a pocket or a purse, uh, and likes the idea of the flip because it's it's more compact. I mean, and there are devices right now out there, out there that can do that. You get the flip. I, th- I want to say the, not a couple of generations ago, we had the very small LCD, and, or ones that just don't even barely have these like one line displays. You can have that. So you're like looking at it as a glanceable piece of information. But I think when you go to a 3.4 inch or larger screen, that's full color, 60 Hertz, it should be able to do a little bit more than act like a bunch of widgets. Now, 
to Samsung's credit, they do have the the ability to add apps. You got to go into the settings and find it, and they give you a list of six apps you're allowed yeah, to install, kind of annoying, though. which is very lame. And two of them are me different messages apps, so that's even worse. I mean, these are text messages apps. But if you jump through a ton of hoops, and it's in my review right now of PC uh, PC Mag, if you get Good Lock and then run through like 15 steps, you can install any app on the Good Lock widget. And even then, it may not run, which is more mind-boggling because some guy who made uh, Cover OS or Cover Screen OS, which used to work on the old Flip and other devices, he spent time at the or he or she I don't know went to this to the Samsung store, learned how to create support for the new Flip, and it works now. So in other words, it can run any app and pretty much any widget, but Samsung has decided to close it down for this. I assume. In my perspective, a little bit like very Apple-like control, like this is the experience you're going to get because this is the one we'll get, let you have. But Moto, since I think they have less to lose, they're like, go for it. It can go inside, outside. We don't care. You can run apps however you want. I, I really I think that for the durability aspect, I like that you don't have to open the phone because if you've got a limited amount of yeah. folds, why waste them? Because like you have to type a one-line message back. Now, granted, you could do that with both of these devices, but... There's just so many small things that I didn't realize that the Razer can do on that small screen. Because again, a 3.6 inch screen on the Razer is slightly larger than the 3.5 inch display that was on the iPhone, the original iPhone. So it's not That's that crazy. Wild. Yeah. To yeah. Type. Now, aspect ratio is different. So I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that. But like, it's sure. very different. Yeah, it oh, sounds yeah. like you look the at Razor... the original iPhone, and I'm like, this isn't real. <laughs> there's <laughs> no way we all used that's this for children. And thought it was. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> that's no way. There's no way. Who could even see it? I want to. I want to hold hold you. You know, to to picking uh, one of these, but I, I feel like it's pretty clear that you like the Razor Plus better. Is is there something about the Flip Five that you would say it did better than Razor Plus at all? Right, the, the hardware's the hardware's way better. It's stronger. It's got better better glass. Like I said, it's got better IPX8 ratings. I mean, the other one's got an IP52, I want to say, so it's got something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's dust versus water, right, on the on the two. The Razer, basically, if it sees water, it's going to freak out. So I, I would not it's recommend... It's splash resistant. Yes, <laughs> versus dunking yeah. one. So I'm not a big mm -hmm. fan of that. I will say that the software implementation on the Razer is better at this point, but as a piece of hardware, the Flip 5, I'm, I'm just basically, it's one software update from being, like, perfect, or almost perfect. It's so close to being perfect that it's just maddening that it's just a software tweak that they need to do. Uh, and maybe that'll happen between now and its release on the 11th because, I mean, the software is supposed to be baked by now, but it's very frustrating. Um, but yeah, so hardware-wise, I think the Flip 5 is amazing. I think software-wise that the Moto has figured out the right way to go from inside to outside and back. If you had to choose just one, which one would you pick? Might be different for different people, but... Uh, I'd probably pick... As it stands, with no like out of the box experience, I'll go with yep, Razer, yep. Razer Plus. Yeah, because of the software, it sounds like. Yeah, right. I, don't, I don't want to tinker with that right Just now. More, more to do, more to tinker. Um, well, uh, since 1977, the Voyager 2 probe has been tinkering around in the universe, uh, exploring it. Uh, and while 12.3 billion miles away from Earth, I mean, it's far, uh, it tilted its antenna to point to degrees away from Earth, this is last month, after an incorrect command was sent and it lost contact. In fact, we talked about it at the time. It was very sad. You know, that Voyager 2 has been around for a long time. However, NASA reported on Tuesday that during a regular scan of the sky, which it does, it picked up a heartbeat single, signal rather, from the probe, indicating that Voyager 2 is still ticking out there. Now, NASA can't talk to it yet. They've got a huge dish in Canberra, Australia, which is now trying to regain contact with the probe by sort of bombarding the area they think Voyager 2 is in with the correct command, original command. But even if that doesn't work, Voyager 2 is already programmed to reset its orientation multiple times each year to keep its, its antenna pointing at Earth with the next reset on October 15th, at which point NASA says... We will probably have a joyful reunion if we don't before then. I think the, the most identifiable part of this story is entering a wrong command and then spamming with commands to undo it. Like <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. every one of yeah. us has experienced that. It's just crazy to think of NASA doing it yeah. over a 12.3 billion miles. Eject. Control Sorry. C. Control C. Control C. Control C. Control C. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I hope it works. This and if it awesome. doesn't, hopefully October 15th resets it. But yeah. I, I remember when I was like Voyager 2, well, you know, it's been around since 1977. Yeah. I mean, we were lucky to have it as long as we did, right? But the fact that Voyager's like, I'm just slightly off course, but I'm here <laughs> is just very heartwarming. Yeah, it's, it's good that we, we know it's still out there. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We got a lot of feedback on our e-bike conversation. Uh, that was during yeah. our extended show, Good Day Internet, uh, with Megan Maroney uh, and Roger and myself yesterday. Um, so we'll read a couple of them. Uh, one comes from Daniel, uh, who's an avid cyclist, also has a motorcycle, knows a lot about e-bikes. Daniel says, in the U.S., legal e-bikes come in three classes. Class one, pedal assist only up to 20 miles per hour. Class two, the same but throttle up to 20 miles per hour. Class three, pedal assist only up to 28 miles per hour. My gosh, that's really fast. Uh, Daniel says, when most people complain about crazy e-bikes, most of the time, these are those 30 to 50 miles per hour max speeds with throttles. And if they even have pedals, they're kind of a technicality. They need to be banned and you obviously need a license and insurance to ride a motorcycle. I think class two and class three e-bikes should only be allowed for adults and some licensing or permitting is probably appropriate. Daniel also reminds us that when people complain about bicyclists breaking laws or motorcyclists breaking laws, that car drivers break the same laws at about the same rates, but with more dangerous consequences, the solution always seems to come back to better and safer infrastructure. And then Lynn uh, forwarded a link from electrek.com about California Assembly Bill 530, which is in draft and set for committee vote and wants anyone without a driver's license to need a license for an e-bike and e-bike ban for anyone uh, younger than 12 years old. Thank you. Lynn, well, I, for yeah, that. I haven't, I haven't re uh, read the, the draft of the bill, but that does not sound like the worst idea after our conversation yesterday. Yeah, no, I was I was um, pleasantly surprised just how many people were into that conversation. We got more emails about e-bikes uh, than we have about any other topic this week. Uh, so right. uh, good, good pick. Good topic. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, I think it was I think it was Megan's idea. So thank Megan Maroney. Um, but we're first going to thank you, Aya Zaktar, because you are a wonderful human. And we're always glad to have you on the show. Let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Uh, go to PCMag.com. I got the review of the Galaxy Z Flip 5 up right now, working on the review for the Z Fold 5. Should be in, uh, should be up in the next couple of days. Uh, all my stuff's there, PCMag.com, and there's a lot of great information there, so stick around. Yeah, read that and uh, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, there's another foldable out there that Ayaz has been trying out, and he's none too pleased with it. Find out why IAS is not pleased with the Google Pixel Fold. Stick around. Just a reminder, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. Happy Taco Tuesday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>